Well, good morning, East River Park. We are so excited this morning to have our full band here today to do some worship, to have a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. Hopefully, we will get back together sooner than later. We miss all of you. We love all of you. Will you join us today as we just have a wonderful time in worship?
what changes you? What will it take for you to see the darkness of your sin and trade it for the beauty and the hope of Christ? What, what will it take? This morning, we will find the answer to that question. Last week, I, I spoke on repentance from the gospel of, of Luke and my, my fear. And teaching on a word like repentance is that you would just tune me out. Okay, because, because the word repentance, for, it, for me at least, it drums up these, these images of angry Christians holding signs on the side of the road that say repent or die. But that's not, that's not the beauty of repentance. God do, does not offer repentance as a form of, of judgment, but as a form of freedom. So, l- let me give you the definition of repentance that I gave last week that will work from uh, today. But repentance is this, if you're taking notes, it's this. Change your mind about sin and choose the righteousness of Christ. Change your mind about sin and choose the righteousness of Christ. Change your mind about sin means that you start to see it for what it is. It's something that doesn't line up with the Bible. It's something that God hates. It's something that leaves you empty. It's something that leads to death. But that's only half of repentance. See, the second half involves choosing the righteousness of Christ, not trying harder, not trying to become this perfect Christian, but choosing Jesus and His righteousness. It's rest in Jesus. It's freedom in Jesus. Repentance realigns your, your mind and your heart to the gospel of Christ, and then He will begin to do the work through you. I want to talk specifically about what ignites that process. Okay, now, now that we know what repentance is, what is it that, that flips the switch in your mind and your heart and your soul that you begin to see a need for change? What is it that takes the death of sin and then exchanges it for the hope of Christ? So, here's the question that we're going to answer in this message. What ignites your repentance? What ignites your repentance? What flips the switch for change? What causes you to to change your mind about sin and choose the righteousness of Christ? What ignites your repentance? So we're going we're going to stay in the gospel of Luke. We'll be in Luke chapter 11. If you want to turn there, if you have a digital Bible, we have the ESV, if you got the church email, uh, all the main passage of the main passage will be in your notes. You can track along with me. Um, but b- before we read in Luke 11, chapter 11, uh, let's pray uh, together. Father, we humbly come before you asking and pleading that you would use moments like these uh, to change us. That as we open your word, um, regardless of where we're watching this or listening to this, that we might be changed by the power and the authority of Scripture. And we pray these things in your Son's name. Amen. There was a man that could not speak. This man had had a demon living inside of him, and Jesus banishes this demon from the man's body, and then he begins to speak again. That's a pretty simple explanation of the story in Luke chapter eleven. The crowd that had gathered was a they were they were amazed, but but not all of them. Some begin to say that Jesus that he's casting out demons with the power of Satan, and that's not a small accusation. They're saying that Jesus, that he's using the demonic to manipulate the demonic. And if that sounds crazy, that's because it is. Some in the crowd begin to say that they should test Jesus. And they wanted him to prove that he was actually from heaven. So, if you look at uh, Luke eleven, fifteen through 16, it says, But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. Now, we need to file that in our, in our memory for the message this, this morning. The people wanted a sign. They wanted, they wanted proof that Jesus really came from heaven. 
Now you can read Jesus's response if you want. He just intellectually dismantles their arguments of those that oppose him. But I want to give us a glimpse of this narrative so we can see how we get to verse 27 in the text. Jesus, he, he's healed this demonic man. He's in the middle of a lecture to the crowd. And then he's gained a follower, a fan along the way. So if you, if you have a, a Bible or tracking along with us, I'll be in Luke uh, chapter 11, starting in verse 27. And as he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So mid-speech, this woman interrupts Jesus to offer him a compliment. Now, some hand clapping or an amen would have done just fine, but she wanted her opinion to be heard. So, she gives a a compliment to Jesus in the form of a commendation of his mother. Jesus, he should be flattered. Okay, he he loves his mama. We can see that as his ministry continues. So, if you say, Jason, your, your mom she raised you right. She must be a blessed woman. What would my response be? Thank you. Or, yeah, my mom is pretty great. All of those would have been a natural response, but Jesus isn't just natural. He is supernatural, and supernatural means that he is about his business above anything else. So, he's not being rude to the lady and his response. He's providing her response, not what she wants, but based on what she needs. And so, she says, blessed is the womb that bore you. And Jesus responds in the text, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So, the the crowd is amazed by the miracle of, of Jesus with this demonic man. The crowd is captivated by the powerful teaching of Jesus, and then the crowd just begins to grow. So, look at verse 29 as we continue in in Luke chapter 11. Verse 29 says this, And when the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So, we have this crowd increasing. It it, it wasn't a small group to to begin with. They're already a crowd. And then verse 29 says that it was getting larger. Jesus must have been aware of this. Now is his time to shine. Like if he was ever going to deliver a perfectly panned speech, now is the time. His crowd was captivated. His crowd was growing. And here's his opening line in verse 29. This generation is an evil generation. Apparently, it it doesn't feel like Jesus took a public speaking class in college. You're supposed to start out sermons or a speech with a good story or a personal illustration or maybe of a thoughtful question. That's not how Jesus operates. Okay, Jesus doesn't tell you what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. So, his opening line in the text to the crowd, this generation is an evil generation. And he says this because they're demanding a sign. We saw that after the healing of the demonic man. Jesus, he, he's getting kind of sick of signs. Not, not because he's exhausted and performing miracles, but rather it's exhausting to have a sign that people continue to ignore. And we just sense this, this exhaustion from, from Jesus here. No sign will be given except the sign of who? Jonah. Now, now let's pause because we're, we're about to converge Uh, the Old Testament stories and New Testament teaching. And this is not easy to understand, but we'll do our best. I'm going to split this into two manageable sections for us. We'll look at the story of Jonah 
And then we'll look at the uh, queen of the south or the queen of Sheba, which we'll see. So the story of Jonah. You don't have to turn there, but if you want, this is uh, Jonah 1, 1 through 2. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So Jonah, he doesn't listen. He runs away. God sends a big fish to eat him. He lives in the fish for three days and three nights, and then the fish spits him out. Jonah 3, 1 through 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Jonah finally listens. He reluctantly goes to Nineveh, preaches and teaches God's warning. The people of Nineveh are terrified. They believe in God and turn from their wicked ways. For for that time, God spares the city of Nineveh from destruction. Jonah hates the grace that God offers the city. He cooks out in the sun while he complains to God. God explains his grace. Jonah doesn't care. That's the end of the story. Now, and I'm sure I missed some stuff, but you can read it for yourself. The point is this. Jonah was sent to the city of Nineveh to preach repentance to that generation. So story of Jonah, here's the queen of the south, the queen of Sheba. And we're, we're getting this from 1 Kings chapter 10. So 1 Kings chapter 10, starting in verse 4, it says this. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord. There was no more breath in her. And she said to the king, The report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom, but I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told to me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpassed the report I heard. Happy are your men, happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. The point is, the queen of Sheba, queen of the south, traveled many miles to hear the wisdom of Solomon and and her mind could not fathom it. So let's find some clarity in these two Old Testament references. Why did Jesus just share two Old Testament references to the crowds in verse or in chapter uh, 11 of Luke. Jesus is saying, Jonah preached repentance to the generation in Nineveh, but I'm greater than Jonah. Jesus is saying, many traveled to hear the wisdom of King Solomon, but I'm greater than Solomon. Jesus is saying to this this Jewish crowd, I am greater than all that have walked the earth. I have come to bring salvation. Will you listen and believe? Jesus came to offer repentance and salvation in a way this world has never seen. He's making a point here to the crowd. Repentance begins with the preaching and the teaching and the wisdom of truth. Will you listen and believe? It's safe to say that the crowd is, they're they're sort of listening, but they're certainly not believing. They've seen Jesus do miracle after miracle, and guess what they want more of? Just a few more miracles. They want a sign. They want proof for the legitimacy of Jesus, but they've been given proof and they, they ignore it. He's confronting this crowd and he's trying to tell them, look, I've, I've done the miracles and you don't get it. I'm greater than Jonah and you don't get it. I'm greater than Solomon and you don't get it. Jesus is saying primarily to this Jewish crowd, you don't get it, but others will. Jesus is saying to this Jewish crowd that in the last days, the people of Nineveh will stand up and judge you because they listened to the word of the Lord and repented. Now let's address something confusing here in the passage. Does anyone know what happened to Nineveh after the story of Jonah? We often don't visit this one. This is out of Nahum, everyone's uh, favorite book of the Bible. Uh, This is chapter three, five through seven. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. 
and who will lift up your skirts over your face? And I will make nations look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. Just, you know, it's a real good feel good passage. And I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. And all who look at you will shrink from you and say, wasted is Nineveh. Who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? It's safe to say that that repentance didn't last long for Nineveh because God destroys the city uh, around 612 BC. So that leaves us a problem in this passage. How will the people of Nineveh judge the crowd at the end of all time when it seems like their repentance isn't lasting? It's possible that Jesus is referencing Nineveh and the queen of the south as pictures of all Gentile believers. So Jesus is saying to this this crowd of Jewish people, look, if you won't listen to me, then some Gentiles will, and Gentiles will judge you in the end. And it sounds strange to us, but I believe it would be a strong warning to this Jewish crowd. If the Jewish people won't listen to the hope of Christ, there's some Gentile people that will. Jesus, he, he heals this demonic man, and the crowd wants more miracles. Jesus is greater than Jonah. Jesus is greater than Solomon. Will anyone listen and believe? Will anyone change their mind about sin and choose the righteousness of Christ? What, what, what is it going to take for you? What ignites your repentance? So, let's, let's answer that and we'll continue. What ignites your repentance? This is about as simple as it gets. It's the Word of God. What ignites your repentance? It's the Word of God. It's the words found in this book that you either read or you hear spoken to you. And I, I asked you to file this for, for memory, but remember that what the woman says when she interrupts Jesus? It's not, it's, not a, it's not a story smashed in between other stories on accident. It's not a throwaway narrative. It's placed in scripture for a specific reason and purpose. So, Jesus says to the woman in the crowd in verse 28, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Jesus, being the word of God, is saying to this woman, Blessed are those who listen to me and obey. Repentance begins when you, when you consume, when we consume the Word of God. Let me put it this way. You will never see the change God wants in your life unless you listen to what He's trying to tell you in His Word. It's not going to happen. You can become a better person on your own, for sure. You can, you can become stronger. You can make more money and increase your bank account. You can acquire more friends. Certainly, uh, you can become a better version of you, but you will not become more like Christ without His Word. Repentance is ignited by the Word of God. So, we see this reality in the sign of, of Jonah. The city of Nineveh was never going to change on their own. Wicked generations do not teach themselves righteousness. So, Jonah, he had to go into the city, proclaim the word of God, and only then was repentance ignited. What ignites your repentance? It's the word of God. Repentance is ignited when scripture invades your life. You will never see your sin for what it is and the hope that is offered in Christ without Scripture being a part of your schedule. So, Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Reading the Scriptures allows God to do surgery on our heart. Where the word of God, it just begins to dissect. This is good. Let's, let's keep that. This is evil. Let, let's get rid of that before it causes an infection. On Tuesday, 
I brought my kids here to church and uh, just to run around and burn off some energy. And I, I put them to work pulling some weeds around the plants around here. And they helped, but mostly they just stood in my face and ate boxes of nerds that they found in the church office. But one of them asked me, why do we have to pull the weeds? Now, I, I'm not sure that he really wanted to know the answer to that. I think it was just a complaint, but I responded anyways. I said two things. I said, first, it just makes it look nicer. And secondly, if the weeds continue to grow, it will kill the flowers that we want to grow. And that's what sin does in our life. That's what sin does when it grows in your life. It will grow and it will take over the garden of your heart and then it will kill you. The word of God begins to dissect what is good and what is evil in our hearts. We need the word of God to ignite repentance in our life. So what do we do? How, do, how does our church become a, a, a full of people that have been changed by God? Okay, not just a bunch of cultural Christians that like this idea of going to heaven when they die, but, but people that are changed. How, how does that happen? Let me give you three things. Just, we're going to end real practical here. So practical tips for igniting repentance with God's word. Three practical tips. Here they are. Plan it or it won't happen. Plan it or it won't happen. If you don't schedule time to read or listen to the Bible, it will not happen. Okay, your world will not stop for God unless you make it stop. For many of us, the quarantined life has just reminded us that, that doing what matters wasn't a time problem, it was a heart problem. So we should never say, I don't have time to read the Bible. It, it, it's better to say, I don't value reading the Bible as much as I do other things. Like, at least that's honest. We make time for the things we, we value. So if you want freedom that repentance offers in your life, if you want to see change happen, you must find a way to get scripture into your mind on a consistent basis. If you need to start anywhere, just 15 minutes a day, 15 minutes a a day. It's less time than most guys spend in the bathroom, okay? So, 15 minutes a day. Plan it or it will not happen. Secondly, read it for the hope that it brings. Read it for the hope that it brings. The Bible, it's, it's a grand story of God saving His people. The Bible, it's not a rule book. The Bible is not a self-help book. It's, it's a narrative of how God uses busted up, sinful, and broken people for His good plan and His purpose. We read the Bible for full of hope that God saves His children. We read the Bible full of hope that God takes people like me and, and you and uses us to bring Himself glory. It's a story of eternal hope. Read it for the hope that it brings. And then lastly, keep it for you will be blessed. Keep it for you will be blessed. Jesus, he tells the woman in the crowd, blessed is the person that not only hears the word of God, but keeps it. The Bible, it changes our mind about sin for the purpose of living or leaving sin behind. We, can, we confess our sin and start to keep what God says is good and right. This is the cycle that believers are in until we breathe our last breath. Obedience to the Bible will lead to a blessed person. Whether you find blessings in this life or the life to come, keep it, keep it, and you will be blessed. So we take, we take preaching and teaching of Scripture seriously at East River Park. Okay, it doesn't matter if we're online or if, or if we're in a small group or if we pack the sanctuary, we're going to be in the scriptures. Okay, not because we think we're better than anyone else, not, but, but rather we understand that no person can truly be changed apart from God's word. The preaching and the teaching and reading of God's word is the process of igniting repentance in my life and in your life. As we read the Bible, 
as we repent, we will become more and more like who God has created us to be. What ignites your repentance? What ignites your repentance? It is the Word of God. Plan it or it won't happen. Read it for the hope that it brings, and then keep it, and you'll be blessed. So let's, let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the conviction that it brings. We do believe. Father, we, we believe in your, wor- your word to be true. We believe Jesus is who he says he is. God, we confess that our hearts are wicked. We confess that we say and we think and we do things that we don't want to do. So God, help us in this process of, of repentance. Help us to be a people that love your word, that are in your word consistently, consistently. If we want to see change, it is not apart from your word. So God, help us in this area. Help myself um, struggle with this often. So help us to be people of your word. And so God, we, we just pray for encouragement for everyone that might watch this or listen to this, uh, that their hearts and lives might be changed, not by anything I had to say, but by what your word has to say. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.